All right, um, welcome and thank you everyone for coming out. Um, I'm Greg Booth, in case you didn't know, and this is my project, uh, Bulwark Tech. Um, a little bit about me, I am a grand new high school senior, and I will be graduating this year, hopefully. Um, I am an avid programmer. I have uh, two years of programming experience here at Grand New. I took the AP Computer Science A and AP Computer Science Principles uh, classes. So all of my fundamentals in coding kind of come from Grand New. Um, as well as that, I am actually attending UCCS this upcoming fall semester um, for computer science security, or cyber security, whatever you want to call it. And as well as that, um, in my future, I would love to become a penetration tester. And in case you don't know what that is, it's basically someone who um, engages in ethical hacking. Um, so what is my project? Um, my project is um, inspired from the Tor web browser. And you know what the Tor web browser is? It's the web browser that everyone uses to access the dark web. Now, my web browser doesn't actually access the dark web, um, but it does follow the basics that Tor uses. Um, and what I mean by this is my web browser uses a proxy server reader. Now, originally, when you're normally when you're using um, a web browser and you type something like YouTube.com into your um, like into the domain, you'll connect directly to YouTube's server. This way, YouTube will be able to see all of your information and you'll be able to see all of theirs. This is exactly what I'm trying to avoid in this project. So in order to avoid the situation where YouTube can see where I'm connecting from, I'm using a proxy server relay. And for this situation, let's just imagine that we are here at Alice trying to connect to the Jane. <coughs> so we'll type in Jane's domain name in our web browser. And rather than connecting directly to Jane's computer, we're actually going to send all of our information over to a proxy server. And this proxy server is going to encrypt all of the information and then send all that information over to another proxy server. And then it's going to continue this process all the way until it gets to the last proxy server. And once it gets to the last proxy server, it's going to decrypt all that information and connect you to um, Jane's website. Um, and once you connect to Jane's website, uh, Jane's website, it's going to send that information back to the last proxy server, encrypt all that information, and then continue to go back towards Alice's computer. Um, so, for this project, um, my expert advisor was my uncle Lance. Um, he unfortunately couldn't be here today, and he has his uh, bachelor's degree in computer engineering, so he has lots of coding experience. He was a great help in this project. Um, with this, I have my support advisors, um, Aaron Call and my parents. Um, Aaron Call and both my parents um, were actually the majority mostly used for. Um, moral support for this project. Um, and they keep me going when I get distracted, because they do get distracted quite a bit. So they're there to keep me on task. Um, so for this project objective, I wanted to become a much better programmer this year. And I also wanted to get better at public speaking. I wanted to get a better understanding of networking. I wanted to get better at programming management, uh, big programming management specifically. And I also wanted to get a better understanding of encryption. And after going through this project, I can safely say, that I obtained all of these goals except for gaining a better understanding of networking. Um, I really didn't get into the networking side of this project as much as I would have liked to do. Um, I did do a little bit of networking, but not enough to where I think I have actually gained enough knowledge. Um, for this project, I used Visual Studios and MySQL. Um, Visual Studios was the IDE I used, which is where I was coding all of my encryption, my um, web browser even. And then the MySQL is a database server that I used to post all of my information for the IP addresses for the proxy servers. Um, I will not be talking about the SQL server too much in this project because um, it was kind of a small portion of it towards the end. Um, so one of the biggest things I had to research going into this project this year was the difference between asymmetric and symmetric encryption. Um, symmetric encryption is a linear encryption method, which means that once you do it one way, you can do the reverse almost but you can do it the other way by using the inverse. Now what I, mean, what I mean by this is, when we encrypt the password using something like x squared, we would decrypt the password using the square root of x. Um, as you can see, this is linear because it goes one way back the other, basically just using an inverse of one in the other direction. Um, this means that symmetric encryption is extremely fast because it's not quite as efficient. Um, asymmetric encryption, on the other hand, is not linear, where you go, but it is also a lot slower. And it's not linear because you cannot come to one side of the encryption algorithm and figure out how what the other side is going to output. Or you can't reverse it from the other side, basically. 
Um, so to explain asymmetric encryption, I'm going to use the example of Eve, Alice, and Bob. Now Alice and Bob will be continually um, sending messages between one another. And Eve is going to be the middleman who's trying to steal this information. So basically in this situation, um, Eve is trying to break our encryption algorithm, while Alice and Bob are public and private keys. Um, and for this situation, we're going to say that Alice has the color red, and for Alice, this is her private key. And for her color red, she's going to find the color that makes it with red to make the color white. And in this case, red makes it with cyan to make the color white. So Alice is going to send cyan to Bob, and when she does this, Eve is going to intercept the cyan color, and Bob is also going to take the cyan color. Now, Bob is going to say, I want to send the color yellow to Alice. And so he has this color yellow, and he says, OK, well, to make this a little bit more secure, I'm going to mix my color yellow with this cyan. And so he's going to get this color green. And when he gets this green, he's going to send the green to Alice. And when he sends it to Alice, he intercepts the message and also makes the green. And now you'll notice that the difference between Eve and Alice right now is that Alice has this red, while Eve has a cyan. Um, this is extremely important because when the two mix their colors together, so when Alice mixes her red and her green together, and when Eve mixes her cyan and her green together, they get different colors. Alice gets the color yellow that Bob was sending at Alice. The, the yellow that he wanted is basically wanted Alice to decrypt. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Um, the important part of this entire um, demonstration right here is just to kind of show you that no matter what you do as a middleman, trying to steal or trying to figure out what's going on with the encryption algorithm, you will never be able to figure out what's actually going on inside the encryption algorithm. You'll never actually get the same result that Alice would. Um, so the asymmetric encryption algorithm that I used for this project was RSA encryption. Now, just like the um, asymmetric encryption that um, I just showed you, it works in the same exact manner. Um, except for this, in this case, we use prime numbers as our private key. And these prime numbers are going to be numbers that are 200 digits long. Um, and they're also good prime. And this is extremely important because when we multiply P and Q together, we get the integer N. Now, that goes into our public key. And this is extremely important in um, any encryption algorithm that includes asymmetric because fact um, using so prime factors is extremely useful because when a computer sits here and tries to find the prime factors of any number, it has to go through every single prime number and multiply it to its corresponding number in order to get to n. Now when we have 200 digit long numbers being multiplied together to get n, it's going to take a computer over 100 years just to figure out what the prime factors are in a computer. So that's obviously really good in encryption because if someone's trying to break my encryption algorithm and I know about it, I can easily just change my Q and Q and they'll have to start all over again. Um, another very important part to RSA encryption is modular division. And if you don't know what modular division is, it's basically division but with reminder, uh, remainders. And so this means that if you take like 5 mod 2, you're going to get the answer of 1 because 5 divided by 2 has a remainder of 1. Um, another example would be if you have 7 mod 5, um, you're going to get the answer of 2 because 7 divided by, or 7 divided by 5 is, has a remainder of 2. Um, so you might ask, like, why is modular division so important when it comes to encryption? Well, it's super important when it comes to encryption because there are so many situations where you have mod 3 where it's going to have a remainder of 2. Um, so this means Unlike normal division, you're not able to work backwards. You're not able to look at someone's remainder and tell what number they started with. Um, this is important, extremely important for RSA encryption because we don't want them to know what our LTRP is or any of that stuff or CTRP. <clears throat> um, so a couple of roadblocks I encountered with RSA encryption is that you cannot actually get 200 digit long numbers with any coding. Um, one of the biggest variable types in C++ is the unsigned int. And the unsigned int um, has a maximum value of about 4 billion, which is only 10 digits long. I need something that's 200 digits long. So I had to look into this and figure out a solution. And what I eventually came down to was I wanted to use something called vector math, or vectors. Um, and a vector, if you don't know, is basically a list. Um, 
In this case, I'm using a vector of integers, but in every single indice, it's only going to have a single digit. So this means that if we have like 123, it would turn into 1, 2, and 3. So three individual um, indexes. Now, because I decided to go with vectors, we have another problem of vector math. Um, vector math becomes a problem in this because we cannot just take the number 2 and multiply it by our vector. This is because they're two different variable types. So what we have to actually do is multiply this 2 by every single individual number inside of our vectors. And this becomes a very big problem when we're sitting here and trying to um, multiply two vectors together. As I'll explain in a second. Um, so in order to actually finish my RSA encryption method, I had to go through and create, I had to do a bunch of vector math. Um, and in this case, the uh, different programs that you, algorithms that you use are big in, uh, big in multiplication, exponential division, addition, subtraction, and regular division. Um, and I'm going to get into the more complicated ones just to kind of show you what I had to do. So please bear with me. Um, so the first thing, this one's actually pretty simple. Big, the big in library, or my big in library, takes in a string of numbers and it converts it, it converts it into an integer and puts it into a vector. Um, so this means if we have a string of 123, like I've used the example before, it would turn it into 1, 2, and 3. Okay, so this one is a little bit more complicated. So this is when we're trying to multiply two vectors together. Um, there's a huge issue when multiplying vectors together because we can't just multiply 123 by 456 and it's going to be vector form. Um, this is because the way coding works is you're only able to multiply one digit by one digit at a time with these integers. You can't multiply vector by vector. Um, and in order to overcome this, I actually use a pretty basic thing done. It's the way we all do multiplication ourselves. And so we have three vectors. We have vector 1, vector 2, and vector 3. Now vector 1 is 123, and then we can vector multiplying it by vector 2, which is 456. So vector 3 right here. Vector 3 is where all the information is going to be entered um, after we multiply the thing. So I filled it with six zeros because we know that whenever we're multiplying a three-digit number times a three-digit number, the maximum number of size we're going to get is a six-digit long number. Um, and so when multiplying 123 by 456 in vector form, we have to multiply what we do in everyday life, um, where we multiply the six by the three, six by the two, six by the one individually. And this becomes more complicated because we have to actually add everything into the vector form. And like I said before, we can only have single digits in every single indice. So whenever we're multiplying like 6 times 3, we're going to have the number 18. And I can't put 18 into the slice index over here because it, it won't work. So what I had to do is I took the 1 and I added it to the 10th place of the vector. Pretty simple this. Um, I ended up with 2, I moved 1 from here and I added 2 and so forth. Um, it's, it's basically just number of multiplication. As you can see later on though, it becomes a little bit more complicated when these um, individual indices start filling up with values a little bit greater than 10. Um, when they fill up with great values greater than 10, we use modular division and that solves the problem. And as you can see right here, I went through and explained, the, I kind of showed how what it looks like towards the end. And if you don't believe me, you can look it up, but, um, 123 times is 56,080. Okay, and so for the next big, for the next big um, algorithm I had to use, um, I went into something I call the big eight modular division. Now, like I explained, modular division is extremely important when it comes to um, doing vector math or doing my RSA encryption for that matter. So what I learned, or what I figured out on my own, was that if we take the number three, we can multiply the three by itself up until it gets to be the same size as the number we're trying to find the modular division of. Um, and once I do this, we get 3, 9, 27, 81, and 243. Now this looks a lot like binary, and just because it basically is. Um, the way I decided to do modular division was, I thought that, okay, well, I can just transfer this into binary division, uh, binary addition, and from there, take the remainder and figure out what's left. So what I did was, I compared the 122s to 243 and said, Okay, is 243 less than 122? Ultimately, it's not. So then I went to the 81 and said, okay, is the 81 less than 122? And it is. So I add the 81, and then the 27 again, and it's the 27 plus 81 plus the 122, and it is. I did this for the 9 and the 3, 
they were both, they both um, added up to a number of under 120. And at the very end, I did 122 minus 120 and got the answer to 2. Now, 122 minus 3 is also 2. So that's kind of how I did the modular division. It's a little confusing, but it, that is how it works. Um, and as you can see here, this looks like a huge string of numbers on the screen, and that's because it is. Um, this is actually the setup I used for my modular division. And right here is um, basically 2 to the power of 662, as you can see up there. Uh, so yeah, it, you can eventually start to do very big numbers. Um, and this right here is actually the final encryption program. Um, so you can see right here, um, this is kind of like a default IP address, because I know some of on YouTube, and I didn't want to use my own IP address in this presentation. Um, <laughs> But, so I use 192.168.3.1, which is what I am going to use to log into the records and information for that. Um, and it actually encrypts this huge stream of passwords. Um, and each one of these is an individual number. So this right here, this huge line of numbers, is actually one being encrypted on our RSA encryption program. Um, and also, I, I got this IP address from the um, SQL server. Um, okay, and then for the web browser, the web browser deals, uh, I, built, I built the web browser using Visual Studios. And for those of you who know what Visual Studios is, it's the idea. Um, but it also has a bunch of templates you can use. And it actually, after doing a little bit of research, I discovered that they had a template for a web browser. Um, what the web browser template does is it basically gives you the renderings that you need for the web browser. Um, but you do have to set up everything else. Like you have to set up the functions for it to load a new web page or to go back, or to go to a home screen, or for it to refresh the page. But it does handle all the renderings, which is the super complicated part of any web browser. Um, with this, our web browser only handles basic functions. Um, for example, it cannot go to Chase's website. Um, and that's only because my web browser does not handle many scripts. Um, it doesn't handle scripts at all, actually. And as well as that, it has a very simple GUI that I'll show you in a second. So yeah, right here is the GUI, which is the graphic user interface. Um, as you can see, it's just a simple back for home refresh and go. Um, it's a very basic web browser, but it does serve its purpose. Um, so then this leads to the question of why did I not finish this project? Um, and the biggest reason why I didn't finish this project is because I didn't have to do anything related to network management. Um, in order for me to send my information between web browser and the proxy servers, I need to build a program that would actually manage the packets and everything you can send from one location to the next. And I never did that. I simply just didn't have enough time. I spent a little bit too long on the encryption algorithms. Um, this leads me into my timeline. So everything you see on the left is what I had originally planned. And then everything you see on the right is what I had actually conquered. Um, and so for those who don't know, originally my project um, I was super ambitious and said, I'm going to do, I'm going to make the entire web browser from scratch and the entire encryption algorithm from scratch. This was ridiculous because what I, the project I did just now was even too much work for me. I wasn't able to finish <coughs> networking stuff. So the fact that I was thinking about completing the web browser from scratch and everything else was insane. Um, however, beginning of October, I did end up still falling through and trying to make my web browser. I did a little bit of research with WebKit and stuff, which is um, the rendering engine that I would use in my web browser. Uh, however, towards the end of October and the end of November, I had spent a lot of time doing research on how I say encryption. As well as that, I'd like to point out that I did make this basic display window, and you can see it right here. Um, this basic display window that I was going to make was going to be for um, my web browser, and it was going to be used for holding all the renderings and whatnot for the web browser. Um, I am so glad I didn't go with this process, because just making this simple little window that just is able to resize it and put on the file and help off sheets, which have nothing under them, this right here took almost 300 lines of code. So it would have been completely inefficient doing it through um, just making my entire web browser. I would have never finished it. I would have been lucky to have rendering so I could be here. And so um, from the end of the November to the middle of December, I was still working a lot on my RSA encryption program. Um, I was still working a lot on the big end stuff, and I eventually actually moved on into 
implementing my big hit stuff into the or big hit algorithms into the RSA encryption method. Um, and then, so from the beginning of or middle of January to the middle of February, I continued to work on the RSA encryption algorithms and methods and all that jazz. Um, and then towards the end of February, I was actually starting to work on the web browser. And it's fixing a couple of glitches, because at one point my web browser had some really weird glitch to it, where whenever you do anything in the search bar, it would open up a different web browser. So it was kind of funky. And from the end of the, um, February to the end of March, I was once again just working on the web browser, and I eventually moved into working on the SQL server of taking the IP addresses from the um, servers and then using them to encrypt them. Program. And then basically April has been used to make sure that the program at least works for the presentations and kind of expand some of the things as I have. And also I just worked on presentations. Um, that's a great project. Does anyone have any questions? If you plan on doing it, uh, actually this summer I was planning on going through and doing some of the like actual networking side of it, I was going to start like plugging my little lamp for lunch and asking him if he could help me with the networking because that's one of the things he specializes in. So I was hoping to finish that this summer. Um, well, basically, that doesn't work because I didn't implement anything like that in the web browser. Um, I use everything that Visual Studios gave me. So. I don't really understand, like, I don't know which scripts work because I haven't looked into that part, but I do know that certain scripts, like, I mean, it won't work anything like JavaScript. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you.